and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today for Astronaut Academy. My name is Alicia. I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host today for the program. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering our programs, please do click in the link in the comments or in the description. Also, feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And also let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid before, or maybe if you plan on visiting us sometime soon. So today, to kick off the start of a new school year, we are going to talk a little bit about what it took to become one of NASA's early astronauts. Those guys were looked at as these huge celebrities back then. And we're also going to look at how those qualifications have changed throughout history all the way up through today. But before we get into that, I want to back up a bit and talk about why we, a former Navy ship, are even a space museum in the first place, right? So for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located in a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed in 1943, and it served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And then in 1982, it was converted into what we all know and love today, the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. So we're docked right off the shoreline of Manhattan on the Hudson River, just a short walk from Times Square, and we are open to the public seven days a week. So do come on by and visit us if you are in the neighborhood. Now, our name, of course, uh, it's pretty clear, right, why we're at Sea Museum, right, because we're a naval ship, all right, the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, we're an aircraft carrier, we served out in the ocean, like a floating airport, basically, carrying planes and equipment and sailors to places all the way across the ocean. We are also, of course, then an air museum because we launched and carried and landed a number of airplanes and helicopters. And actually, we could hold up to about 100 of them on board. Uh, this image right here on the right is actually the Avenger, by the way. This is our oldest airplane on display from World War II. But why are we also a space museum? Hmm. We'll take a look at this. Does anyone happen to know what this thing is? Tell me in the chat if you do. Uh, but what is this big black kind of almost light bulb or, or flashlight shaped thing here? Hmm. It says United States on it. There's a flag. Now, some people, when they look at it, they say it kind of looks like an ice cream cone kind of tilted on its side or uh, maybe a megaphone, you know, to amplify your voice. But this thing here is a very, very special vehicle that has to do with space. So this is something called a space capsule. Yes, I see in the chat a few friends are saying that. Absolutely. And it's a very special one because this is how astronauts, our early astronauts, actually used to go into space. So a while ago, back in the 1960s, during that Cold War era, NASA, our space program, was in a race, a space race with the Soviet Union or modern day Russia. And of course, every race has a finish line, right? So ours was to be the very first country to safely land a moon, a, a man, excuse me, all the way on the moon and return him home again. But of course, there were a number of smaller steps that we had to take before making that giant leap on the moon. You don't just roll out of bed and end up, you know, on the moon, right? So we had to first figure out how things, uh, you know, could happen up in space. How do we even get into space in the first place with rockets? And how do we breathe and sleep and eat and work for long periods of time up there? So this is part of one of those smaller steps, this thing right here. And also it has to do with why we are a space museum. So this is a replica of a Mercury space capsule. And this is what those early astronauts rode inside of during their earliest missions going up there, even before we went to the moon. Now, in 1962, this guy right here, Scott Carpenter, one of our earliest astronauts, went up in a capsule just like the one I just showed you. And actually, you can see it on the top of the rocket on the right there. That little kind of black thing kind of looks like a Hershey kiss. Uh, the rocket, of course, is the thing that goes up into space, brings it up there. All the fire comes out of the bottom there to help. So Scott Carpenter went up. He orbited around the Earth a few times while doing some experiments. But of course, you know, what goes up must come back down again. So eventually he came back down to Earth in that capsule and he landed where all of the rest of the astronauts landed, of course, 
in the ocean. They figured that the water would be this nice kind of softer landing surface than on land, you know, on a mountain or on a house or something. And also a bit easier to aim for, right, since water covers 70% of the Earth. So after floating around in space, these astronauts would be out there floating around in the ocean. And then people would come to rescue them, pick them up in a helicopter, and also retrieve their capsule. So uh, this is an image here from some of our later ones. And also you can see our as astronaut being uh, rescued here on the right. Now on very uh, two very special occasions, everyone, uh, once during the Mercury missions, of course, with Scott Carpenter, and also once during the Gemini missions, Intrepid got to be the prime recovery vessel and pick them up. So, you know, this is a great picture on the left here. They're all lined up looking at this floating capsule to be retrieved. How do you think they felt, right? Such an important, amazing event going on there. Uh, and so these are, again, these pictures from retrieval. Um, all of the sailors lined up. And on the right there, you can actually see it being craned on board the ship. A really, really special day. Uh, I would imagine they'd be pretty excited. And we do have some postcards and things in our collections that were printed just to celebrate the occasion. And of course, lots of sailors definitely wrote home to their loved ones going, whoa, guess what just happened today? I think that'd be pretty cool. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are also a space museum. The Intrepid played a very important role in picking up astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space during our earliest missions. Now, again, those early steps, Project Mercury, were really just to see if people could, again, reach outer space and survive up there for a while before setting their sights a bit further away on the moon. And I'll tell you, that race we were involved in was not going very well up to that point. The United States kept losing to the Soviet Union in pretty much everything. The Soviet Union got the first satellite in space the first animal in space, even the first man and woman in space. You know, we were always really, really close behind, but the Soviet Union, they just kept beating us, even just by a, a couple of days sometimes. So, you know, imagine being an American at that point. How's that going to make you feel? Pretty frustrated, right? Now, of course, if your goal is to eventually send a man to the moon, you have to have the men, the astronauts, right? And arguably, some of our most famous astronauts were these guys, who soon became known as the Mercury Seven. Now, in that famous picture on the left, we have, from left to right, uh, Wally Shira, Alan Shepard, Deke Slayton, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Gordon Cooper, and, again, Scott Carpenter. Uh, he, again, was that guy picked up in the Mercury capsule in 1962. Uh, we also later picked up Gus Grissom during Gemini 3 as well. And he is actually that shorter guy in the center uh, in the back row there. So in 1959, these seven men, brave and brilliant test pilots in peak physical condition, they were selected to be our very first astronauts as part of NASA's first space Mercury program. All right, so the Mercury 7 were part of the Mercury program. It's actually really interesting. A lot of people don't realize that Project Mercury was originally suggested to be called Project Astronaut. It doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Uh, but remember, this is before we had ever even used the term astronaut. The, the name didn't stick, though, for the project because they realized, well, they didn't really want to make it about the people so much as the missions as a whole. So they did decide to call it Mercury instead, which focused more on the goal of being the first and the fastest to get to the moon. Mercury, of course, being our first planet and the fastest planet in our solar system to orbit the sun. You might have heard that in one of our earlier programs. So what were the astronaut qualifications at the time? And how do you even train and prepare someone to exist in the conditions of space, having no actual information from any previous astronauts and really just making guesses about what space is even like? And then how could they then simulate or recreate that sort of you know unusual feeling, all those things that they expected up there, but down here on Earth, where we don't have it. Things like weightlessness, right? Or, or the disorientation of space. Well, to start, NASA had to put together a basic set of requirements to figure out the baseline of health to study while in space. They, of course, wanted the best of the best for the missions, and they got it. Uh, but, you know, they had to really think about traits first that were the ideal things to have for an astronaut. 
Now, these qualifications to become one of the first Mercury astronauts all stemmed from the same criteria that were used for high altitude research flights. So basically military test pilots, since that was the closest thing that they really had to space flight. And by virtue of the fact that those guys were still alive, they figured, yeah, those guys are probably pretty good at their jobs. So in addition to serving in the military, the qualifications were that you had to be under 40 years of age. Uh, you also had to be in excellent physical condition. You had to have a height of five feet, 11 inches or less to fit into the suits. And of course, those small capsules too. You had to hold uh, at least a uh, bachelor's degree in uh, a science or engineering field or the equivalent and be a qualified jet pilot with at least 1500 hours of flight time. Now, as you can imagine, that narrowed the field quite a bit. In fact, at the time, only 110 men met those basic requirements. It's about 22% of all candidates screened. And then after a series of tests, only 32 of them were selected to advance on to the next round of testing. And of course, very much in the public eye before the final seven were chosen for the Mercury missions in 1959. Now, the criteria did loosen slightly with each new class, but I do want to point out that while the majority of these qualifications could be accomplished by either sex, the criteria of being a military jet pilot, the one you see in gold there, also completely eliminated the eligibility of any woman because they were blocked from doing that because of their gender at the time. Women were not allowed to receive official military pilot training until the 1970s. So while not saying it outright, this qualification, well, it really made women just completely excluded from meeting even the minimum requirements. So the trainees underwent rigorous physical and psychological experiments to test the limits of what the human body could withstand. Uh, extreme heat and cold, these giant centrifuges that stimulated, you know, simulated the, the gravitational pull of the earth during uh, takeoff, right? You had electrodes to measure their brain activity and so much more. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute. But Scott Carpenter, that astronaut we picked up, he once said that he looked at the whole experience as a test of his determination, and he thought that showing any discomfort meant showing weakness. And really for him, it was about mind over matter. Uh, John Glenn, another one of our most famous astronauts, felt the same way. But there were others who thought maybe it was a little bit too much. Uh, Deke Slayton, for example, said he felt like a captive specimen at the time, kind of like a lab rat. And Pete Conrad said uh, that he was starting to feel like NASA only cared about their bodies and weren't actually placing enough emphasis on their other qualifications, like their brains, you know, being a trained pilot or having an engineering degree. The tests were, you know, definitely skewed in that regard, uh, but it was important again for them to establish this baseline of health. So all of this highly publicized testing really spurred interest in the space program, but it also made some people start to think a little bit about these qualifications and start to wonder, well, why couldn't a woman be just as capable as a man based on these tests? So with Cold War tensions mounting, this space race heating up, and rumors of women in the Soviet Union space program, and at this point we were still in the running, some Americans began to question the purpose of this sex restriction. So a few months later, the aviation editor of a popular periodical, Look Magazine, decided to do a feature around the question of this restriction. And with NASA's approval, they invited champion aviator and race car driver Betty Skelton to be the very first woman to undergo the Mercury Project's testing protocol at NASA's research facilities. And they thought she'd be a good candidate due to her acrobatic flying records, her background in automobile racing, as well as just her mental strength and her fast reflex. So she jumped at the opportunity, and over a period of four months, she got to travel across the country to various testing facilities. Uh, she met with the Project Mercury astronauts and also Soviet space scientists uh, just to, to brave this intense testing regimen alongside the Mercury 7 themselves. And she said that it was just the biggest thrill she ever had. She had the opportunity to get to know each of the astronauts personally. She made friends with them. And as they went through the testing process together, because they were so impressed by her flying record and skill, they actually even gave her the honorary nickname Seven and a Half. All right. But you have to remember, you know, going into space, 
it's not a walk on the beach like it is here on earth, right? So in addition to a physical examination, she also performed over 80 tests. Now, some pictures you can see here, um, some that involve swallowing a tube to monitor digestion, injecting dye to measure her liver absorption rates. They monitored how fast her hand would close while shocking her with electricity at the same time. Also a vertigo test that involves squirting freezing water into her ear. And she also sat in a sensory deprivation chamber for hours to test her responses to isolation. She walked on a treadmill that gradually would get steeper and faster while testing her lung capacity. She had to go through, again, this extreme heat and cold. And she also worked underwater to study, again, that disorientation in near weightlessness. That's how they would try to simulate it. But fun fact, she actually couldn't swim but she didn't tell them that. <laughs> now, throughout this process, she also, though, experienced some things that made her a little uncomfortable at NASA. The astronauts and the scientists would sometimes say or do things that made her realize that maybe they weren't really interested or even prepared to seriously consider women as astronauts at that time. For example, when she was visiting NASA's headquarters in Virginia, she said that she didn't think that they had ever even had women around their ready rooms before. There was also a test where the administrators couldn't figure out what she should wear while she was lying on a tilting platform. And that's that picture you can see here on the left. Now, at first they recommended a hospital gown, but then they thought better of it once they realized, well, yeah, the table, as you can see, is going upside down and her feet are going up in the air. Uh, so yeah, instead they decided to give her some oversized men's pajamas instead. And to make matters worse, they hadn't told her to bring a change of shoes. So she just wandered around the place the entire time in her high heels. Now they called her nicknames like Cosmo Naughty and Astronet and Space Girl and Lady Astro, but she took a lot of it in stride. And while she knew that this experience was largely a publicity stunt and that the results of her trials most likely were not going to suddenly convince anyone at NASA to start accepting women, she still felt obligated to do her very best and to prove that women had the potential to do really well in this role as an astronaut and the nation watched with great interest. So the events that unfolded there, again, uh, these were the first time now that a woman underwent the same physical and psychological evaluations to be an astronaut as her male counterparts. And this experience ultimately became the cover feature of Look's February 2nd, 1960 issue uh, with Skelton wearing a prototype spacesuit in front of a Mercury capsule replica under the headline, Should a Girl Be First in Space? I mean, it really was an inspiring glimpse into what might have been. And they referred to Skelton as a petite example of the anatomical fact that women have more brains and stamina per pound than men. That's their words, not mine. The Look article then fueled public interest, though, even more. It sparked so much frustration also from her fellow female pilots uh, and also just the interest from a handful of scientists who grew even more curious about what women might be able to offer as astronauts. So shortly thereafter, with all of this excitement, another fascinating experiment began on 13 women who are now referred to as the Mercury 13. Dr. Randolph Lovelace, the doctor who had originally developed the Mercury Project experiments for NASA, set up his own privately funded program just for women. And he even suggested that it might be more practical from an engineering standpoint to send women into space over men because they generally weighed less, so they would require less fuel to get them up into space, and also they would need less oxygen to survive. So in February of 1960, just weeks after the Look magazine you know, hit the shelves, uh, Lovelace began to screen and test candidates who later became known as the First Lady Astronaut Trainees, or the FLATS, at his facility in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And of the 19 women who took part, 13 of them passed and, again, are now more commonly referred to as the Mercury 13. And you can see images of all of them here. Now, one of these women in particular, Jerry Cobb, who is uh, in that big picture and then also on the right there next to the capsule, she even passed in the top 2% of all participants to ever take the test. So really, the evidence was becoming pretty clear that the women were just as qualified as the men. But this also really scared NASA at the same time, who was already feeling the pressure to succeed in the space race. They didn't want anything to go wrong or to distract them from their goal of getting to the moon. 
So just one year later, they had the program shut down. But the ladies were undeterred. And they continued to protest to anyone who would listen, even to the president. In fact, this letter on the right here um, was drafted in 1962 for the president um, to send to the NASA administrator, James Webb. But as you can see, President Lyndon Johnson didn't want any part of it. At the bottom of it, he wrote, let's stop this now. And he filed it away in his desk, never to be seen again until many years later. Ugh, pretty frustrating, right? Now, some of the Mercury 13 even took part in meetings of Congress about women having the chance to go into space. But in those hearings, John Glenn himself, the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth, even testified against them. And he said, quote, it's just a fact the men go off and fight in the wars and fly the airplanes and come back and help design and build and test them. The fact that women are not part of this field is a fact of our social order. <sighs> that hurts, right? Now, that might be a little surprising to hear today, right? John Glenn is one of our national heroes. We do love him, and even he wouldn't back them up at the time. So sadly, nothing ever became of their fight. Now, again, this was 1962, and we were always just one step behind the Soviet Union in our space race. So because of all of this, just one year later, in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova of the Soviet Union broke the sex barrier and beat us to having the first woman in space. There she is on the left. And sadly, it would actually take another 20 years before the same opportunity was offered to an American woman, Sally Ride, in 1983, who, of course, we do obviously love and celebrate as well. But yikes, that took a really long time. Now, I mentioned that some of the t these tests, right, that the trainees went through um, were, were very intense. But before we go into more details about what those were like, I want to pause real quickly and see if we've got any questions about some of the stuff that I have mentioned so far. And then thanks, everyone, for your comments in the chats here. Very awesome. Uh, why are they called astronauts? Yeah, so NASA got that word from um, the naming tradition that started off with the Argonauts. Uh, so if you've ever heard of, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, right? Not, N-A-U-T, it's the Latin root there. It means sailor. So if you're familiar, you know, again, with that Greek mythology, um, the sailors of the Argo, Jason and the Argo Knots, the Argo sailors. Uh, they went out uh, in search of the Golden Fleece, right? Uh, and then that naming tradition continued on with Aeronauts, A-E-R-O, which, you know, basically means sky sailors. Those were people who pioneered flying around the world in, you know, hot air balloons. So astronaut, astro means sailor of the stars. That's where they got that word from, which I think is really, really cool. All right. Any other questions? Uh, did any of the women who did the astronaut test get to go into space? So sadly, no, they were all really, really qualified, but unfortunately it just wasn't uh, the right time. And NASA wasn't ready to have them be astronauts yet uh, until recently, but I'll get to that in a second. Many have passed away since then, right? But um, back when they were still launching the space shuttles and uh, this was now, you know, actually after they started even letting women become astronauts too. Um, so they were a little bit too old at that point, but NASA invited them to come to watch the launches from time to time. So uh, they they were all there, you know, when Eileen Collins became the first um, uh, female pilot to uh, uh, pilot the space shuttle, I know. So they were definitely there. They definitely followed the program. Um, but most of them, no, never actually got to become astronauts, with one exception. Recently, now that, you know, space tourism is really taking off, uh, recently, uh, Wally Funk, who was the youngest of the Mercury 13, had the opportunity to go into space as a tourist on Blue Origin, which is uh, Jeff Bezos' private company. So that is so exciting that he, you know, offered her that opportunity to finally fulfill her dream. Uh, but otherwise, no, the rest of them sadly never got the chance. But let's talk about some of that, some astronaut testing and training, what, what those Mercury 13 and all of the other guys had to go through, right? What did it look like uh, during those early missions to start? 
Well, in all, there were about 87 exercises, both physical, meaning with your body, and then also psychological, meaning with your mind. And they were done over three different phases. So phase one involved testing the limits of the human body by simulating or recreating some of the conditions that they expected the astronauts to encounter in space. Now, again, they had no idea what was going to happen to their bodies because no one had ever gone up there yet. Maybe their eyes would change shape and they wouldn't be able to see anymore, or maybe they wouldn't be able to swallow. No clue. So they were really just making up these tests and their flight plans as they went. So they did a number of tests to withstand stress and pain. Uh, for one test, they were sealed into a room that was heated up to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. That's super hot. Um, there is a picture of Scott Carpenter there on the left, sweating through his jumpsuit while he was doing that one. Uh, and in another test on the opposite end of that spectrum, they held their hands and feet in ice water for several minutes while having their blood pressure measured. So they really wanted to see how they reacted to extreme hot and cold. Now in another test, they shocked them with electrical pulses. They tested their reflexes. In that picture on the right, actually, there's Jerry Cobb undergoing that. Um, if you've ever you know, been shocked by accident, maybe you know that you're walking across a carpet, you touch a doorknob. Imagine something like that, but 100 times more powerful. And uh, in yet another one, they actually shoved a three-foot rubber hose down their throat to monitor their digestion while they were eating food. So again, these tests were all meant to see how your body reacted to some extreme physical simulations. Uh, now, another test that they did was to shoot ice water into their ears to give them something called vertigo. So that is when you get really, really dizzy. Uh, so in the pictures on the left here, we can see Wally Shira and Jerry Cobb again getting cold water pumped into one ear. And that can actually start something called nystagmus, which is when your eyes start moving uncontrollably. You have lost your equilibrium. Um, you are really, really dizzy. So um, those funny looking glasses that Wally is wearing on the top there, it let the doctors see that reaction more clearly. And then the other part of that test was to see how long it would take for you to regain your sense of balance. So that was meant to simulate what you might feel if, you know, your space capsule uh, capsule ejected from the rocket booster and then it started tumbling around really, really fast. Uh, so to test your balance, um, they would have you walk across a balance beam, which you can see on the right here. Uh, you got John Glenn doing just grand, looking spiffy in his bow tie. And then you've got Scott Carpenter to the side of him doing not quite as well. <laughs> um, you can even try this at home uh, if you want. If you spin around in a circle a number of times, just keep going and then just trying to walk in a straight line. See how long it takes for you to regain that sense of balance again. It's a little bit difficult. Now, they also trained on treadmills and stationary bikes, but to an extreme. This wasn't just regular exercise. They wanted to test their strength and their breathing. So you can see here you had things like keeping a steady pace to a beat for 10 minutes, up and down simulated hills, uh, sometimes while also being hooked up to a breathing apparatus to test their lung functions and oxygen intake since of course, that would be a very rare and valuable thing up there in space. And these tests were actually referred to as basically being the lung powered equivalent of that game at the fair where, you know, you take a sledgehammer um, and you, you hit the bottom on that scale to make the thing go up and ring the bell. That's actually what it was compared to. You would breathe into this thing and try to make, you know, something else move around. Now, they also had uh, equilibrium tests, again, to try to throw off that sense of balance while you were doing a task. And, of course, this tilt table test, which also tested how dizzy they would get while lying down or being upside down. Uh, they would lie down on the flat table. Um, their heart rate and their blood pressure would be measured every minute for 30 minutes while they were tilted from horizontal up to 65 degrees back again, just up and down like that. Uh, again, this is the one where they put Betty Skelton in the pajamas, by the way. And then they also trained on an orbital flight simulator centrifuge. So this was a capsule attached to the end of a long arm, and it simulated the G-forces that they would feel during the launch and landing by swinging the capsule around in a circle at different speeds and at different tilts. And you can see here Gus Grissom on the left and Scott Carpenter, again, um, those two guys that we actually picked up on the Intrepid uh, on different missions, though, um, riding on this centrifuge here. 
Now, what was that like, right? So there are some popular carnival rides that maybe you've even been on where they spin you around in a circle and you stick to the wall. Oftentimes it's called like the rotor. Um, and then the floor like drops out. Uh, it's kind of like that. Also, if you've ever um, been to Disney World, uh, that Mission Space ride, right? They actually use the same exact principle to simulate those G-forces of you taking off and landing in a spaceship. Um, they're just spinning you around, you know, a room, a round room on a giant arm. It is exactly like that trainer. Uh, of course, on the ride, it's only about two and a half times gravity that you are feeling there. And then on the Apollo missions, that was more like you know, 10 times that. Uh, I think the most that someone has ever gone through uh, at one of the simulators is something like 14 Gs. So again, that's 14 times your own body weight pressing down on you. And you feel that, right? Uh, if you look at Gus Grissom's face here on the left, uh, you know, I think he's feeling it too there. He's definitely got that facelift thing going on there. Now, another kind of ride uh, that you might associate with NASA training actually is the famous Mastiff Simulator that stood for Multiple Axis Space Test Inertia Facility uh, to, again, simulate that idea of your capsule tumbling around in space. Very important you're able to regain control of that. Only now, this was to test your actual reaction in terms of gaining control. So they wanted to make sure you were able to physically do that uh, and quickly. So the Mastiff was a 21 foot rig with three metal cages, which allowed the movement of all three directions. So what we would call pitch, which is up and down like this. It's yaw, which is side to side, and then roll, which is kind of like, you know, rolling over like a dog. Now, at the same time and at the center uh, was a replica of a Mercury space capsule seat and a hand controller. So the trainees had to use that controller to regain control of their capsule while the rings were spinning and they were moving all around. And apparently the first time that uh, Alan Shepard, our first American in space, rode it in 1960, he instantly turned green and he hit the kill switch to make it stop. He ultimately, you know, obviously figured it out though. So the Mastiff is um, similar to the multi-axis trainer, which is again, probably the first thing that people think of when they think of astronaut training, uh, especially if maybe you've ever been to space camp. But the one that, uh, that you know, you commonly would use at space camp or at Kennedy Space Center, uh, that one was ever never actually used um, it for these trainings. It was actually just kind of more of a novelty ride for visitors. Now, again, a lot of these were done because they simply just didn't know what would happen to the human body. So it was over preparation. Uh, and once they were, you know, a few flights in, they realized, yeah, some of these are probably a little unnecessary. So they got rid of them. No problem. Now, phase two had a number of psychological exercises. Again, things having to do with your mind. Uh, if you've ever heard the word, of course, psychology before, it has to do with the way you think. So things like IQ tests, anxiety tests, the Rorschach test or the inkblot test, hundreds and hundreds of questions to try to frustrate or annoy them or just to dig deep into their personalities. And these were important to make sure that they could stay focused and calm in very stressful situations because of course these were high risk missions. Later in Gemini and Apollo, it was also important because they were gonna be teamed up with others for long periods of time in small spaces. You know, imagine having to take a really long road trip with a sibling, maybe It'd be a little bit difficult. You might love them, but sometimes they get on your nerves. Well, the astronauts did and did not take these tests seriously because, again, they thought it was kind of a bit much. Uh, for example, during his inkblot test, which is when you look at smears of ink on a piece of paper uh, and you basically just say what they what you think they look like, um, you know, it's kind of like finding a, an image in the clouds, kind of. Um, so Pete Conrad was presented with a card that looked like this. Now, what do you see here? Nothing. It's blank, right? So he saw this and he thought, oh, this is so silly. So he thought he'd be funny. He looked at the card for a long time. He hemmed, he hawed. Oh, I don't know. He squinted, he scowled at it until finally he told the doctor in all seriousness that he just couldn't see it properly. And the doctor looked confused and he said, no, 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 I can't see it properly. You're holding the card upside down, which of course is so silly because the card's blank. So needless to say, he did not make the cut for the first seven astronauts because he wasn't taking it too seriously. 
Now, this inkblot test was developed in 1921 to be used in hospitals to figure out what possible mental disorders the patients might have to help to diagnose them with their problems. But of course, anyone outside of a hospital can take it too. And really, no matter how you answer it, it could be interpreted a variety of ways. So, you know, you can take the meanings kind of with a grain of salt. Um, there's a lot of skepticism over whether this test is actually valid, uh, but it can be kind of fun. And the way it works is, again, kind of like finding images in the stars or in the clouds, right? There's a series of 10 cards that you're supposed to just say the first thing that comes to mind when you see it. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no way to like win at the inkblot test. It's very subjective, very open to interpretation. And your results could say anything from, you know, you're very creative to the fact that you might be feeling a little upset right now. So keeping that in mind, and of course, I am not a doctor. Let's look at a couple together. So tell me in the chat, everyone, what do you think this looks like to you? What do you think? Let me know. Maybe as you're looking at this, uh, you know, you might say it looks like a bat, maybe, or a butterfly, maybe a moth. Maybe you see, yeah, Vash has a butterfly or a moth, frankly, else is a bat. All right. Uh, maybe you see an angel with outstretched wings. Or maybe, you know, you notice the center there. Maybe you see a bunny rabbit with those ears in the center. You can see a whole variety of things, right? Here's another one. What if I turn it sideways? Do you see something different there? So some people, uh, when they look at it, they see a crocodile or even a whale. It's kind of jumping out of the water and then the bottom part is its reflection. Can you see that? So according to this test, seeing a mirror reflection indicates you've got a great imagination. Though if you see something like a crocodile with those jaws, you know, with those tips on the end there uh, on the top uh, and on the bottom there, that might indicate a crocodile. You're feeling a little bit angry about something at that time. Here's another one, everyone. What do you see here? All right. So the most common answer for this one, if you're looking at it here, oh, someone said a narwhal for the last one or a boat on fire. Okay. The first, so for this one, the most common answer for this is that it's two people maybe some gnomes, right? Facing each other, touching hands. Do you see that? Maybe they're wearing little red hats, right? Uh, the main thing is if you can't see that, if you can't see people, maybe you've got some problems in your relationships with other people. But what else can you see here? You know, maybe in the white area in the middle, you might see something. Some people say that that white spot in the middle looks like a jet fighter from a, like looking at it from above or, um, you know, or maybe also from below if you're looking at it. Um, of course, if you've seen some of our other programs, you might know camouflage, right? And how some of our planes are actually painted white on the underside to blend in with the clouds. So maybe that's what that is. But if you said this image might look like two bears fighting with blood everywhere, you might be a little anxious or nervous about something mm -hmm. right now. So, you know, again, no wrong answers here. Just use your imagination. A spaceship in negative space says necessary taco. Nice. Two people doing high fives says Cooper Poe. Awesome. Love that. <laughs> or maybe a face says Vashson. Great. Awesome. And all right, here's another one. One. One last one for you all. All right. Now, this one's kind of fitting for our program today. Tell me what you see here. Now, this one, uh, and you know, it's got a lot of colors on it. And it's got an interesting, an interesting pattern here. This one is often interpreted as a rocket launching upward with flames below it and smoke around it. Do you see that? Maybe you can see fire in those red and yellow colors. Or maybe when you're looking at it, you see a many colored flower in this one. You could see a lot of different things in each of those colors, right? Uh, Vashton says a frog and a deer, seahorses and coral. Cooper Post says, I see a meteor. Amazing. You all see such incredible things here. So overall, everyone, when analyzing your responses, they said generally positive type answers that describe things that are alive. So flowers or cute animals or people dancing and giving high fives, right? That sort of thing's great. But if you start seeing things that are negative or sad or have these like mean connotations like dead animals or smushed insects or things fighting each other, that's when they start to look a little more closely at your personality quirks and think, hmm all right, maybe you might not be the best fit to spend a long time in a very small space with another person, like in a space capsule. So this draws a lot from this field of psychology, but again, having to do with your mind. So also, though, these are just kind of, you know, fun to look at. Vashon says, I see a deer riding a frog next to a horizontal lake. Okay, <laughs> great. And Necessary Taco says, nebulae. 
Perfect. That too. <laughs> now you actually can make your own ink blot artwork at home very easily too. All you have to do is fold a piece of paper in half, then open it back up again, put some paint on the paper, fold it back up again and smush it all up inside. That's the fun part, but do be careful that the paint doesn't come out the sides, of course. Then you open it up and voila, you have got an original piece of art that is symmetrical. That means the same on both sides. So what might your artwork end up looking like? Who knows? It's entirely up to you and what you see. But back to that testing, everyone. They were also asked a number of questions and brain teasers, analogies, right? Questions that ask you to compare or contrast things to each other, which I actually kind of always loved on the SAT. But try this one with me, everyone. Metabolism is to blank as combustion is to locomotive. Hmm. So tell me in the chat, which of these answers, A, B, C, or D, do you think is the best fit for this one? Engine, train, human, or anabolism? Metabolism is to what? A, B, C, or D? Any guesses? All right. Oh, we got a couple. Bastion says C. Necessary Taco says A. Excellent. So the correct answer here is C human. Metabolism is to human as combustion is to locomotive. So that has to do with the internal processes and what makes us move. Metabolisms can be found in humans and combustion is how the locomotive generally moves. Uh, here's another one actually. Adolescence is to blank as infancy is to nursery. Now that might be a big word. Adolescence basically means a teenager. So which of these answers makes the most sense? A, asylum. B, youth. C, orphanage, or D, high school? What do we think? Adolescents, so teenagers, uh, are to blank as infancy is to nursery. All right, so we got a couple answers. Excellent. <laughs> All right, some jokes in the chat. All right, and yeah, the answer is D, high school. So adolescents, teenagers can be found in high schools. And infancy, when you are in that stage of your life as an infant, you can commonly be found in a nursery. There you go. Now, they were also given picture puzzles to test things out like spatial visualization or imagining how things move in space. So looking at this one, you know, you have to imagine how this clock would move, but basically around the surface of a ball. So this is a three-dimensional ball, and they're saying that that ball is being rotated uh, to the right. So which one of these, A, B, C, D, or E, do you think that clock would look like if you were to rotate it uh, to the right like that? So imagining that in your head, uh, but being able to know which direction it's going to move. All right, and the answer of this one is B. So that is what it would look like if it rotated. And you can kind of see the little knob on the back of it. That would be the windy part. Good guesses, everyone. And then they were asked um, also open questions like, who am I? And they were asked to write down 20 ways to identify themselves ranked in order of significance and looked at to gain insight on how they saw themselves. Also questions like, who would you like to accompany you on a two-man mission? And also, who would you assign to the mission if you couldn't go yourself to see how well they got along with their fellow astronaut candidates? Now, the Mercury 13 women also experienced an extra test, a sensory deprivation isolation tank that was designed to simulate being weightless in a capsule in your spacesuit while in orbit. And they basically had to float in a tank of warm body temperature water in a pitch black soundproof room. And previously, all of the test subjects, regardless of whether they were male or female, did not make it past six and a half hours without beginning to hallucinate and see and hear things that weren't there. But one of these women, Wally Funk, was actually so good at this that she unknowingly set the uh, record for sensory deprivation at that time at 10 hours and 35 minutes. Now, the Mercury 7 guys didn't do this experiment. Instead, their isolation consisted of two three-hour stints in a small dark room with padded walls and a pad of paper and a pen. That was, at the time, what they thought was good enough to simulate isolation in space. So John Glenn ended up just writing poetry and lists of things that someone could do while sitting in the dark. And Wally Shira just took a nap. 
Later on, though, the doctors who worked on these tests said that they were absolutely ridiculous. They were not meaningful in any way because there was no actual weightlessness. And they also were allowed to do something. But in regards to this isolation tank, he later estimated that spending just 15 minutes in it was probably the equivalent of spending two days in the room that the men had used. So Wally Funk's 10 hours and 35 minutes was actually more like 84 days in a padded room. So wow. And once again, Wally Funk amazing. She's the one that got to go into space uh, at the end of the day. So in all these tests were designed not only to see how well they handled psychological mental stress, but also to understand why and how they tick a little bit better um, to understand, you know, why they wanted to go into space in the first place. Did they just want to be famous or did they like to take risks? Right. So the perfect candidate was excited about it, but not to the point of being reckless too. Now, lastly, phase three involved a lot of training in regards to, again, stressful situations. They had a number of fitness drills. So running, sit-ups, chin-ups, climbing over walls, stuff where um, they just made you keep going, basically, even though you wanted to pass out. And I don't know about you guys, but I basically hit that point after like three push-ups. So I would never survive that part. Uh, they also had an altitude chamber test where they stuck 18 needles into your head to measure your brain activity. And then they strapped you into a seat in a plane and did crazy stuff with the plane. They did these death defying feats at 65,000 feet up just to see how you would react uh, and just how you know your responses would be. And then of course there was survival training. So if something went wrong on re-entry during your mission or launch too, you could end up you know, landing anywhere. So that was actually the case with Scott Carpenter. When we picked him up, uh, he was 250 miles off course from where he was supposed to be when he landed. So a lot of this training uh, was you know, things like surviving in the water or in the jungle or in the desert. And these pictures are kind of fun. On the top left here, you can see a bunch of the astronauts hanging out on their rafts. Uh, some of them are using this mirror. They've got these little mirror devices that pilots would carry with them to help to reflect the sun, to uh, attract any planes that might be flying overhead to, to see them and pick them up. Uh, they, uh, the picture on the bottom there on the left is actually Gus Grissom and John Young preparing for their water landing. Uh, that's the very same one that the Intrepid picked up, Gemini 3. On the right, uh, we can see some survival training in the jungle and uh, in the desert, too. And again, if they landed out there in the desert in that direct sunlight uh, and that heat, you know, they had to know how to protect themselves. So they didn't get sunburned. Right. And they, uh, you know, would went through a lot of the training simulations for that, too. Uh, so there they are, you know, after one of those looking not too thrilled about it. But that is basically a priceless photograph. Now, they also used something called the Dilbert Dunker, which was a replica of an aircraft cockpit from the Navy that the trainee would sit in. And then it was shot down a 45 degree ramp and turned upside down in a pool of water to recreate what maybe a crash landing might be like into the ocean. Uh, so you had to be able to unharness yourself and get out of your cockpit and come up for safety while underwater there. And then, of course... Uh, I mentioned earlier, there was also underwater training in something called a neutral buoyancy simulator for that weightlessness that uh, you can see in the other images here. Um, basically, they went into a giant swimming pool and practiced with an aqua lung, uh, which helped them to breathe. And also uh, in that big heavy space suit, right? But it was weighted accordingly, so they didn't quite rise and they didn't quite sink. So neutral to simulate weightlessness of uh, floating around in space. Something else that you might think of when you think of weightlessness is an airplane that has since been named the Vomit Comet. It was used to simulate weightlessness by flying in sharp parabolas. So up and down, just like that. Uh, and that would put them into free fall for about 20 seconds at a time and make it feel like they were floating. Now, a version of this plane has actually always been used for astronaut training, falling through the sky. You know, it's kind of actually the closest thing we can get to that feeling of free falling in space. Uh, and it was even used on through the shuttle era and even to today. So in the center there, I uh, love this, this animation here. You can see Sally Ride uh, doing somersaults in the air on board there. And of course, you know, there's also private companies too that can do that for you if you are so inclined as a civilian just to see what it would be like.
And then, as you can imagine, there's also quite a bit of studying, too, of their spacecrafts, uh, of their systems, their mission objectives, uh, things like celestial navigation, so finding your way just by using the stars in case something goes wrong, uh, physics, engineering, uh, and the many experiments, of course, that were going to be performed on board each mission. And they also had to stay up to date on flying military planes, too. So there was a lot of training each week in jets uh, like the T-38 Talon, which we've got at the Intrepid Museum up on our flight deck, uh, and training in simulators, too. They had early versions of flight simulators for both planes and their spacecraft, so they spent a lot of time in those as well. Now, later in the Apollo landing missions, we also had additional training um, because those men were going to be leaving their capsules and operating the LEM or the lunar module. So NASA actually built large scale moon terrain. It looked just like the moon and they had a rig for helping them uh, to prepare for stable liftoff. Uh, later missions also trained on uh, sample collection as well for the moon's surface. So they'd actually practice picking up moon rocks with scoops and tongs and things and other tools because it's a little hard to, to, to bend over. There's some funny, uh, some funny videos of them kind of falling over on the moon too. Now this is all a lot of work, right? And it's a lot of training that you had to pass back then. But once we reached the space shuttle era and largely even through today, they significantly eased up some of the requirements for astronauts with the inclusion of roles like the mission specialist or the payload specialist who could be just you know, scientists and not pilots. And also because of the reduced G-forces that were experienced by the space shuttle versus the capsules. So I'm going to pause here one more time, see if we've got any other questions before moving on. Any other questions? Uh, did the Mercury 7 astronauts get to go into space a few times? All right. So many of them did. Uh, you'd think that after all this training, you know, NASA would want to get a lot of use out of them while they were up there, right? So Wally Shira was the first person to go into space three times and was the only astronaut to take part in all three of the major mission sets to go to the moon. So Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Uh, and John Glenn even got to go into space again at the age of 77 years old. Um, they looked at his body way back then, and then they compared it to uh, when he did that. I believe that was in the 90s. Um, and uh, to see, you know, kind of what were the effects of space on people who were a little bit older as well. So that was cool. He got to reuse that training later. Um, Scott Carpenter, Though, uh, he actually ended up putting his astronaut skills to a different test. Uh, he became something called an aquanaut. So water sailor, although that's just a sailor, isn't it? Aquanaut. Uh, so, you know, again, that naming tradition, a little bit strange, but water sailor. Um, that does sound redundant. But that basically means that he lived and worked deep under the ocean for a while. So he was in, um, you know, some underwater testing facilities. So he got to use different types of training. Cool. Any other questions? How can I become an astronaut today? The million dollar question, right? Maybe actually. And that brings us to today, right? So um, I'm actually gonna show you the ASCAN, which means astronaut candidate uh, training program. All right, they currently um, use this system. It began in 1978 and it's typically completed in about two years. So it includes 16 different basic training courses in life support systems and orbital mechanics and payload deployment and uh, earth observations and medicine and space physiology. I mean, you name it. Uh, and you can see a number of images from modern day training here looks a little different, a little more technology inspired, right? Um, now, some of the training, though, is similar, similar to the old school stuff, believe it or not. They actually still use tilt tables and survival training, obviously, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, of course. Um, but then they also do still spend you know, a lot of time flying in the T-38 training plane. But there are a number of things that are updated. So, for instance, they now have an even more advanced centrifuge. This one on the bottom here can reach up to 20 Gs. Uh, their Vomit Comet also has a new updated plane, and they figured out some other ways to simulate partial gravity. You can see in that image on the top center, someone is hanging there, right? Uh, so that's great. Um, that's really good for helping to practice working on the moon um, for our upcoming Artemis missions. And like their predecessors, the shuttle era pilots also used a number of simulators uh, to experience what it would be like to pilot the space shuttle. And of course, today, they've still got many simulators of, you know, each new vessel um, that they've used, things like the Soyuz capsule to hit rides on with Russia and now the Orion capsules, of course, which are launched from right here on American soil again. 
So virtual reality um, is also increasingly becoming popular to help to really immerse astronauts in the world of space. Uh, in fact, NASA has this whole virtual reality lab that simulates visualizations for space, including things like pressure and lighting uh, and mass and inertia, um, and especially for things like you know spacewalks and training for the International Space Station. And also talk about your upgrade. They now have this giant neutral buoyancy lab, which has a full size replica of the International Space Station inside of the world's largest swimming pool. They even actually use virtual reality inside the neutral buoyancy pool, too. Uh, and here's a fun fact for you actually the NFL Football League consumes about 464,000 gallons of Gatorade each season. So the neutral buoyancy lab pool could hold more than enough Gatorade for 13 seasons of that. So that's over 6 million gallons of water. It is big. Now, currently, they say that a six-month mission to the International Space Station takes about five years of training. And there's been some speculation that as we reach the next phase of space travel, with even longer missions going to the moon eventually Mars and beyond, they might actually use the International Space Station as an astronaut training facility in itself up there in space, which means they wouldn't even really need to simulate as much since they'd actually be in microgravity. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the requirements to become an astronaut have changed throughout the years. And today, if someone wants to become an astronaut, for NASA anyway, the basic requirements are to be a US citizen, hold a master's degree in a STEM field, followed by two years of relevant professional experience or a thousand hours of pilot time in jet aircraft and then pass NASA's astronaut physical, which is not quite as intense as the stuff that we just went over. So all this is to say that while we have things, of course, like space camp and the astronaut training experience at Kennedy Space Center, for those of us who maybe aren't as lucky to be selected by NASA as candidates, the actual work that they do and the hours and hours, hundreds of hours of simulation of these experiences that they have to go through, they are intense. Now, everyone, there is also another way, thanks to the pioneering efforts of private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, which you have undoubtedly heard about in the news. Maybe even yesterday, you caught that Inspiration4 launch, amazing, which was the first launch entirely holding space tourists. So the other way these days is to purchase a ticket, but that is gonna set you back a few million dollars. But it is another way. Hopefully, though, they will, you know, be able to pioneer this even further and uh, hopefully it'll become a little more accessible to those of us who maybe don't have that much money. Now, uh, we have certainly, though, come a long way uh, since those days of the Mercury program. But now the goal of the space program, we've got some new ones, right? We've got this long term goal starting with our Artemis missions. And I am willing to bet that you are also going to start to see a shift in some of that training too. So that is going to go along um, with all of these new missions as we keep launching them and as it evolves, especially as technology is also evolving with it. Uh, and of course, more private companies are stepping in as well. So everyone, that about brings us to the end of our program for today. If you've got any other questions about our programs, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. Thank you all out there so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments today and playing along with some of these fun little games. The museum hosts a number of live streams, so please do follow and subscribe to this channel and visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. Uh, if you enjoyed this or any of our other past programs, we would love your feedback too. There is a link in the chat that would be so wonderful uh, if you'd like to uh, click on and answer a few questions that'll help us plan for future sessions. Also, tonight, I invite you to join us uh, in just about an hour, actually, for our virtual astronomy live event with Kerbal Space Academy. So this is a free online event that's going to explore appropriately space tourism. And you are going to hear from our very own NASA astronaut, Mike Massimino, who's our advisor of space programs at the Intrepid, and also Ariane Cornell, the director of astronaut sales at Blue Origin, about what's coming up for them. Really, really exciting opportunity. So you can ask questions and find out how maybe you might be able to save your pennies and buy your own ticket into space. So be sure to also tune in beforehand at 5 p.m. for our pre-show, where 
I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the future of space tourism and also take a look at some incredible artwork created by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab artists. So once again, all that is tonight in just about one hour. The pre-show starts at 5 p.m. and the main event starts at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So you can register in advance via our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also tune in through our platform on Twitch. Now, our next family program, everyone, is Thursday at 3 p.m. next week, and it will be Jobs on Deck, where we are going to talk about the many roles that sailors on ships, just like Intrepid, filled in order to keep their city at sea afloat. So once again, that is Thursday at 3 p.m. right here on our streaming platforms. All right. Once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Our museum is, again, reopened to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. So if you do happen to be in the area, come on by and say hello. We'd love to see you. Otherwise, we hope to see you online for another virtual Intrepid adventure. Thanks so much, everyone, and I'll see you next time.